Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the third annual Kuski Lecture and Dialogue. We are fortunate to feature Janine Benyus for this year's event, and we'll introduce her momentarily. Thanks to all the college deans who have joined us this evening, I'm Carol Strohecker, former dean and now dean's associate at the College of Design. Our new dean, Prasad Bharadkar, will be emceeing the program this evening. Let's begin with a land acknowledgement and statement of unity. The University of Minnesota Twin Cities is located on traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of the Dakota people. We are committed to recognizing the complex history of this land by honoring the truth of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement in the context we share now. We respect the people on whose land we live, work, and learn as we seek to improve and strengthen relations with our tribal nations. We resist the culture of anti-black racism, and we stand with our Hmong, Asian, Asian American, and Pacific Islander communities. We know that words are not enough, and remain committed to the work of eradicating injustices against all black, indigenous, people of color, and those whose gender identity transcends the binary. We stand with victims of violence and strive for peace in our community and beyond. This evening's event is a signature program of the Kuski Design Initiative, KDI, which began as an idea four years ago when the McNeely family approached the university with a desire to honor their friend, Christopher Arthur Kuski. The concept for a lecture and student scholarships evolved through conversations with Chris's partner, Alan Kolkowitz, who's here this evening. Alan noted the importance of dialogue in the design methodology that he and Chris used in their award-winning interdisciplinary firm. We believe that advancing the dialogue across disciplines and any barrier is the key skill that students and all of us need now. The Kuski Lecture and Dialogue Series, along with other KDI programs, provides a platform for diverse students throughout the College of Design to learn about one another's perspectives, as well as the design content of their creative projects and how it extends to many other subjects. Thank you, Alan, for your collaboration in creating this amazing initiative. Thanks to the McNeely family and their Manitou Fund, represented this evening by CEO Oliver Din with Heather Din. Welcome also to the family and friends of Chris and Alan who are joining us tonight. Now, I'm delighted to bring to the stage Dr. Prasad Bharadkar, who became Dean of the College of Design on September 5th. Prasad is a designer, anthropologist, educator and researcher who has led and design and research teams in both academia and industry. Most recently, he served as UX research and sustainability lead at Google's Advanced Technology and Projects Division, where he guided user experience research and sustainable development for health and wellness products. Prior to his work at Google, as a professor of industrial design at Arizona State University, Prasad directed Innovation Space, a transdisciplinary laboratory where faculty and students from industrial design, visual communication, business, sustainability, and engineering work in teams and partner with corporations to develop product concepts offering societal benefit while minimizing impacts on the environment. Prasad also co-directed ASU's Biomimicry Center, which is dedicated to the exploration of biologically inspired solutions to tackle the challenges of sustainable development. Through the Biomimicry Center, Prasad worked with Janine Benyus. We learned about their longtime collaboration just after Janine had accepted our invitation to become the 2023 Kuski Lecturer. 
Prasad was then a candidate in the search process that ultimately identified him as the College of Design's next dean. KDI collaborators are delighted with this outcome and the coincidence of Prasad's prior familiarity with Janine and her work. We hope the U of M can become a new base for continuing this partnership. Welcome, Prasad. Thank you so much, Carol. Thank you. Good evening and welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight for the Kuski Lecture and Dialogue Series. Uh, my name is Prasad Doradka, and I'm the new dean of the College of Design. And I'm absolutely delighted to be here to welcome Jeanine Benyus, who, as Carol mentioned, I've known for several years while we were working with her at Arizona State University. But before I introduce our speaker tonight, uh, perhaps I can say just a few words about why engaging in deep learning from nature is so very important. We, as designers, talk a lot about the notion of human-centered design, or people-centered design, or user-centered design. And I acknowledge that that is better than purely market-driven design or technology-driven design that does not take into account people's needs. But we should also acknowledge that the impact of human-centered design is not on humans alone. The things we make and introduce into this world affect every species on the planet. If what we build pollutes the air, every organism that breathes is affected by our human-centered design. If our trash ends up in oceans, it is likely to choke or be ingested by every creature that swims. So, why should we be so myopic and only be human-centered when we share this planet with millions and millions of species? Why can't we be more life-centered or biocentered? Well, that's where biomimicry comes in. And I cannot think of any other individual other than the fabulous Janine Benyus to tell us more about how we can learn from nature. And so let me introduce Janine Benyus. Janine is a biologist, an innovation consultant, and author of six books, including the landmark Biomimicry Innovation Inspired by Nature. In this book, she named an emerging discipline that emulates nature's designs and processes to create a healthier and more sustainable planet. Since the book's release in 1997, Janine has evolved the practice of biomimicry, consulting with businesses about what we can learn from the genius that surrounds us. Her favorite role is biologist at the design table, introducing innovators to 3.8 billion years of brilliant time-tested solutions. In 1998, Janine co-founded Biomimicry 3.8, the world's leading nature-inspired innovation and training firm, bringing nature's sustainable designs to more than 250 clients, including, there's a very long list, Boeing, Burt's Bees, Cliff Bar, Colgate, Covanta, Estee Lauder, General Electric, um, Levi's, Natura, the list goes on and on. B3.8's mission is to help change makers, innovators, transform the world by emulating nature's design and its core principles. In 2014, as Carol just mentioned, B3.8 established the Biomimicry Center at Arizona State University, a research and education facility offering the world's first online master's degree in biomimicry. In 2006, Janine also co-founded the Biomimicry Institute, which is a nonprofit organization that empowers people to create nature-inspired solutions for a healthy planet. Over the past 25 years, Janine has personally introduced millions to the meme of biomimicry through three TED Talks, hundreds of conference keynotes, and a dozen documentaries such as The 11th Hour, Harmony, the Nature of Things with David Suzuki, which has aired in over 70 countries. She has received multiple awards, including the 2022 Royal Society of Arts Bicentennial Medal, the 2013 Gothenburg Award for Sustainable Development, the 2015 E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Technology Pioneer Award, the 2011 Heinz Award, Time Magazine's Hero of the Planet Award in 2008, 
the UN, United Nations Environment Program's Champion of the Earth for Science and Technology in 2009, the Rachel Carson Environmental Ethics Award, the Lud Brownman Award for Science, Writing, and Society. She also received the Smithsonian Institute's Cooper Hewitt, Cooper Hewitt's National Design Mind Award for visionary work with a paradigm-shifting effect on the world of design. This is only a partial list of her awards. An educator at heart, Janine believes that the more people learn from nature's mentors, the more they'll want to protect them. This is why she writes, she speaks, and she revels in describing the wild teachers in our midst. Please, please join me in welcoming Janine Benyus. Thank you, Prasad. It's good to be reunited with you. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, KDI. And um, Alan, I've been thinking a lot about uh, Christopher, Arthur Kusky, and trying to read all I can about him. I think he would, I think he would love biomimicry. Um, because it is about this incredible, intimate collaboration between humans and the rest of the natural world. It's, it's inherently interdisciplinary. And um, so I thought about him a lot as I was doing this talk, and I, I uh, dedicate this talk to Christopher Arthur Kusky. Um, I am back in Minneapolis. I, um, I spent eight years here. I love this place. I met the love of my life here. Um, and and uh, what an incredible city. It kind of spoiled me for other cities. These lakes, it's an incredibly generous place because of those lakes. And what I want to talk to you about is, I want to talk to you about, as a design community, how year after year after year that I've been working with the design community over 30 years now, every year you've been asked to expand your concept of what good design means. And it's been a lot. It used to be just enough to be, try to be energy efficient or try to use less material, right? But that has expanded and tonight I want us to expand it even farther. And I want to talk about generous design. You hear a lot about regenerative design and they share the same root word. I want to talk about generosity in the natural world. This is where I moved, so I've kind of, you know, I've gotten over leaving the Twin Cities. Uh, I live in western Montana now. I live on the edge of the largest contiguous wilderness in the lower 48, in the Bitterroot Valley. And uh, if you watch Yellowstone, that's where it's filmed. Um, and the unique thing about it, besides I, this is a lake, this is a pond on the property, on our property. Um, talk about generous, living next to a pond like that and next to a wilderness area. When I look out, at those canyons, there are 27 canyons. And there are hundreds of miles of wilderness. If I was to start walking, I'd be in wilderness for hundreds of miles. It's amazing. Now, what it is like living there is living in the plume of goodness that natural systems give to us all the time through what I will call generosity without being anthropomorphic. Wildlands exhale goodness and gift it away. And I will say they are generous and generative. Here's what they give us. They purify our water. When the water comes into that big, big wilderness area, it comes, it's cleaned and it comes into our valley cleaner. When the air comes into it, it comes into our valley cleaner produces wildlife that come migrating, 60 heads of head of elk, 100 head of elk. Abundance is created in these systems and then it goes 
downwind, downstream, it doesn't stop at its boundaries. And that's why I say generous. So these are also called ecosystem services. I call them ecosystem gifts. It detoxifies waste for us, refreshes our soul, cycles nutrients, builds soil, stops erosion before it ever happens, holds the soil for us, produces food and fiber and raw materials. These are all these ecological gifts that these systems give us. To me, that's a great design. The question is, as I live there, I often ask myself, what is this settled valley doing in return? What do the buildings that we're in do in return for the lakes and forests of your urban forest? Why do we never ask ourselves about returning the favor or turning those arrows around? And I would submit that um, if we want to learn how our designs can begin to nourish places beyond themselves, in addition to meeting a de design brief of our client and meeting the market demands and meeting user demands, what I'm asking it to expand now into is to create goodness beyond its borders and actually enhance the place that it is being used, the place where it goes to rest at the end of its life, that it actually enhances that. Because that's what happens in the natural world. Let me give you some examples. This is a snow geese, snow goose. And there's a place that we go to on, on Laura's birthday April 5th, it's, the, it's at the, uh, where the Rocky Mountains meet the prairies and on the Rocky Mountain front, and it's a little place called Freeze Out Lake, and 75% of the Pacific flyway of white birds go there. And it is, un this is what it's like. It's unbelievable. We go with a group of friends, we hang out for the weekend. If you lay down and you don't have a covering, you definitely have like a crime scene of guano around your body when you stand up. It's unbelievable. But it's also, um, yeah, it's awe producing. Um, and what happens when these birds lift up off the, the lake is that they go to the farmer's fields everywhere around there. And they land, they eat some of the seed that's been left over, but then they leave this huge pulse of nutrients, of nitrogen of feces and ammonia. And believe me, none of those farmers have to open chemical fertilizers for their fields. It's a pulse of goodness that they leave. If geese can be a gift to the Rocky Mountain front, and, and these zebras are doing the same thing in the Okavanga Delta in, in, uh, in Africa. Everywhere they go, they leave it richer. Every, every time they eat grass, the grass responds by putting down roots and growing taller. Buffalo herds do the same thing. When they wallow, they create these openings for, for herbs and forbs to come up. They make the prairie richer. This is an animal. Coral polyps, corals are animals. And they make a home, a reef, that's a home to them, but it's also a home for 45 other species. Which of your designs beckons, welcomes, and makes habitat for 4,500 species. And is that what we should be asking ourselves to do? Wolves were killed and extirpated from the West, and when they were reintroduced to the Yellowstone, you, you know, might know that story where they, they basically, the elk had gotten pretty, uh, pretty lazy and had been in the riverbanks and had eaten all the willows down and then the streams had gotten warm and the trout were suffering and beavers were leaving and the wolves came back, put the elk on their uh, heels a little bit and suddenly those willows had a chance to come back, the waters were shaded, the waters got cooler, the trout were able to live again and there was this whole trophic cascade just because the wolves were there. Beavers do the same thing in a watershed as they take out, you know, they'll take out a forest and then there'll be a pond there for a while. 
but it's not always there because the, they have leaky dams and then next thing you know there's a, there's a pasture there and then a forest comes up again and there's, they go downstream and there's this pulsing mosaic. And when you look over um, a watershed that has beavers in it, it's far more diverse than one without. Can we say that about our designs? What about us? What about us? Can humans become a welcome species? And what I mean by that, it's the gauntlet every species has to walk by. It's not a rhetorical question. We're gonna have to learn how to contribute here. The difference between an invasive species and a naturalized species is a naturalized species is one that learns to contribute to its place. So what kind of species are we? This is the kind of species we are. These are, these are folks from our two-year master's course. Uh, we take people, we take students out and um, it's online at ASU, but then we take them out one week uh, at a time for, for six excursions around the world, and this is them crazily swimming to a, in glacier. Um, these are biomimics in the making. Uh, we're an exuberant species. We're also very young. 3.8 billion years life has been on Earth. We've been here between two and 300,000 years, Homo sapiens sapien. We're incredibly young. The biomimetic process is, starts with quieting that cleverness. Uh, listening to the natural world, echoing what we hear. And then there's another part that uh, we're still working on and that's the giving thanks. And I think the best way to give thanks to an earth that gave us this much lush life is to join that design process. Um, those, this is Adam Neiman's work. The ball on the, the, on, on the left there is all the water, ice, uh, salt, uh, vol by volume compared to the, and that's salt and fresh, compared to the volume of the earth, that's it. And in the other ball, it's all the atmosphere that we can breathe. And when life came onto this ball of rock and sea, it wasn't very hospitable. Life actually sweetened this place. Life created conditions conducive to life. And it created those, that sort of atmosphere that we can breathe in, that we can be in. And we are in a long line of species and we have to figure out how to do it as well. Luckily, a sustainable world already exists. So biomimicry is this conscious emulation of this 3.8 billion years of embodied wisdom, how to live well in place. It's learning from locals and it is not new to humans, biomimicry. Indigenous people have been doing this for a long, long, long time. If you look at the snowshoe hair, you'll notice it floats on snow. You'll also notice that indigenous people made snowshoes. Looks a lot like the snowshoe hair foot. It's remedial for Western industrial culture for us to be returning to nature again. Um, it's not bio-utilization. It's not that biomimicry is using wood floors. That's bio-utilization, it's fine as long as it's sustainable. Um, it's not bio-assisted, these are algae that are creating fuel. It's not just using organisms and domesticating them, although you could use organisms in a bio-inspired project. Instead, it's, it's not what you can domesticate or extract or harvest, but it's what you can learn from nature. And in that way, it makes this a very different relationship between us and the rest of the natural world. It allows us to view and value nature in a new light. So this is the Brazilian free-tailed bat, and that's a Nepalese, it's one of the pitcher plants, carnivorous pitcher plants. And you may think that you don't know any biomimetic inventions, but if you went to an airport recently and you did this, you were walking through a Smith detection, it's an Irish firm, that use the Brazilian free-tailed bat to figure out how to make an acoustic camera, a millimeter wave camera that looks through your stuff and keeps you safe. It's that this bat has this particular way of doing its echolocation that's different than any other. Don't you think that we should be giving a percentage of our proceeds for every one of those machines to protect the habitat of the, of the original patent holder? Um, we actually have a program where we're trying to get that done called Innovation for Conservation. 
So the pitcher plants are notorious for having flies go in, slide all the way to the bottom, and not be able to climb back out, and then they get eaten by the enzymes. So um, at Harvard, uh, Joanna Eisenberg and her colleagues have created slips coating, and this is a uh, slippery liquid-infused porous coating that is just like the there are no uh, pitcher plants that are used to make this, of course, because it's not biotilization. They borrowed the recipe for it. They borrowed the blueprint for it. And it is, it's a coating that is not only anti-corrosive, which is a big deal, it's also anti-fouling, um, anti-icing, anti-blood clot, anti-bacteria. So you can see all the uses from de-icing your plane all the way to medical uses uh, that slips coating will have. Thank you, pitcher plant. And that's Joanna, uh, Johanna on the, on the right there. Um, so how we asked ourselves, uh, and that's one of the reasons we started a, a nonprofit institute, was how to, how to nurture this new species of, of entrepreneur. And there are many scientists at the University of Minnesota, in fact, you'll meet one tonight, that, that, is, that are doing bio-inspired work. Um, that guy you may recognize. <laughs> um, that's Prasad um, back at ASU. And um, th there's a new career here called biologist at the design table. And that's what I do at Biomimicry 3.8, our company. We work with the people who make our world, with, with you, with the design community. And we bring biological knowledge to your table. These are the kinds of companies now that are looking into biomimicry. It's become a, um, it's, it's becoming mainstreamed in these innovation labs. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later about some products that are coming out. But before that, in the, in the spirit of expanding what good design is, I want to start at the systems level. Because these systems that I've been talking about, these ecosystems, to get, you know, they have a lot of small, they have a lot of materials in them and a lot of product-like uh, micro miracles in them. But what's really amazing is what they do on, in ensemble. Um, and it occurred to me that it's the one thing we haven't asked ourselves to do. And it occurred to me literally on a plane um, flying into Missoula, Montana, which is just to the north of us. That's Missoula. And you have to fly over wilderness to get there. And as I was looking down, I thought of all the times I'd been hiking and rafting and canoeing and skiing and how fragrant those soils are and the water is so clear. There's so much wildlife and bird song. And then as I was looking down, I was imagining that because I know it to be so in those systems. And then I got to the city and it all stopped. And I literally asked myself why this, our places do not function like the wildland next door. And because that's what biomimicry is, it's about asking well, how does nature do a particular thing, right? It's not, when we do biomimetic design, we don't say what do you want to design, we say what do you want your design to do? What do you want your design to do? So if we changed just what we wanted our design to do, just that function, maybe we wouldn't have the gray areas. See, we, we sort of let ourselves off the hook. We say that the green, the green areas, excuse me, the green areas, the arrows are gonna come in, of goodness, into the gray areas. But we really don't ask ourselves whether we need to do anything to go the other direction. In fact, I was sitting with a group that was doing, really cool group that was doing an eco village in Costa Rica, and they were showing me the map of the eco village, and it's smack in the center of the children's rainforest of Costa Rica. And they had a mylar covering over the map, and they were drawing with a wax crown, and they literally were drawing arrows, and they were saying, it is so cool, we'll get all the birds from the from the uh, rainforest and we'll get all this clean air and clean water and they're drawing arrows. So I asked for the, for the wax crown and I said, and what are you giving to the children's rainforest? And this was an eco village. And they said, that's the beauty of it, nothing. Absolutely nothing. Because we're gonna take care of all of our own waste and 
So we've gotten to think that if we just do net zero, if we just do nothing and get smaller and smaller, that, that doesn't work for living beings, for biological beings. You actually have to give back. So a truly biomimetic city would be functionally indistinguishable from the wildland next door. So how do you make this happen? You say, okay, the UN has a list of 21 ecosystem services, things that I, sh I told you about, like purifying water and building soil and supporting habitat, growing food. Um, so a city or a building or a, or a campus or a university campus would contribute these services and both the infrastructure and the ecostructure, not just planting trees, but literally having the buildings pull their ecological weight as well. How would that work? Every design, including the building's design, should have multiple positive benefits. So how can we do this? We, at Biomimicry 3.8, we started a learning cohort. And these are the companies that are trying this right now. So it's Microsoft, 30 to 50 data centers a year are trying this. Ford, we've worked with them on four of their buildings so far. We're literally measuring ecosystem services of the wildland next door and asking them, their buildings and their sites, to do the same thing. This is why I think Christopher would kind of really like this. Landscape architects love this idea. So how can this building, which is kind of similar to what we get now, function as generously as this ecosystem? So what we do is you have to benchmark what's in a reference habitat, and then you have to do design generously. And so we've been lucky enough to work with um, ecological modelers who have been working on this now for 15 years, a uh, huge ecological model that allows us to go, it's an iPad-enabled app, allows us to go to what kind of wildland would be there if the site wasn't there, if the building wasn't there. Uh, maybe it would be a forest, maybe it would be a wetland or a combination. And then we actually measure the ecosystem services. So how much water is being collected, how, you know, how many gallons in a storm is being collected, what's the nitrogen and phosphorus cycling of this place, how many wildlife, what kinds of habitat support is being given for different kinds of wildlife. And then we go back to the, um, to the building, and usually the ecological performance is way up here, and then the building performance, not so much. But that's okay, because designers are super smart. Um, if you give people current performance and ecological performance, and you say, design to fill the gap, bring this place up to ecological performance of the wildland next door, they do that. It helps if you're looking, if you're looking at, uh, at nature solutions, which we do. We look at critters like, you know, in, in the Northeast, we, we did something, um, we did the Coast Guard building with HOK in DC. And one of our models there was the beaver. As I was telling you, like it does this mosaic of different wetlands going down a watershed in, with different kinds of plant life. And as a result, it really does, the water that comes in at the top of that watershed gets very cleaned and polished by the time it goes down. So that became our model. Um, instead of building two big towers that they were going to build, they were on a sloped site and they decided that they would, for their ecosystem service, their hero service, they would do uh, water purification and water quantity in stormwater. They daylighted a, 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 a piped stream um, that, was, that had been put underground up above. And then those are the green roofs that each have a different kind of plant complement and they are connected so the water that comes in goes down on those roofs and then goes down into that lake. Now, that's a functional building, right? What if all of our buildings functioned like wetlands? Um, what if they were all made of CO2 sequestering concrete? What if every road and sidewalk were made of permeable pavement? We can do this. What if we say parks should sponge up stormwater? They might be a little wet at right after a storm, but then they sponge it up. What if we have things like John Todd's um, eco machines in lobbies cleaning and recycling water. 
What if the roadways, the easements, were actually mitigation corridors, migration corridors for wildlife? What if we welcomed wildlife into our places? We're building a lot of seawalls right now, and a lot of them are just straight up and down concrete. What if they were designed to welcome in oysters, mollusks, barnacles? This is a, a company called E-Concrete e that actually mimicked the, basically the design principles of, of what marine organisms like to do when they're doing larval settling um, and mimicked that and they're making, they're making concrete uh, and seawalls like that. This is uh, Austin. This is a bridge. Um, it ha has anybody been to Austin and seen the bats come out? Okay, so that was a mistake. There's bats that live under the bridge because the members of the bridge happen to be a certain, a certain amount apart from one another and bats love to roost there. So what's happened now is that the bats come out every night at a certain time and Austin comes down and with food trucks and music and has a party and then claps and yells when the bats go up. Like what if we did that on purpose? That would be called habitexture. These are, these is a, a facade that actually that moss is, is uh, an air purification specialty phytoremediation wall. This is, a, this is the Bank of America building in New York um, that Bob Fox did, Fox and Fell did, and it happens to have such a great HVAC system that it cleans the air three times cleaner than what comes into it. What if all of the buildings did that? What if that became something we just automatically did? And this is, um, what if, what if the, the, all of the roofs had, had food farms on them? And what if those food farms were in turn pollinator friendly? So it's one of these things where you just start, sort of try to add up all the ecosystem services you can possibly have. There's the High Line Trail that everybody loves in, in Chelsea and New York. What if infrastructure, what if the design brief was to lift the human spirit while supporting pollinators, while cooling the air? I also think that this is a social justice issue. I think it's an environmental social justice issue because these eco-services that we're talking about, some of them are, are buildings, some of them are plants, and some of them are things that we've never designed before or designed for before. This is designed for ecosystem services. And who's going to design those? And who's going to maintain them? I mean, it's not just green jobs. It's green wealth, it's enterprises, it should be, and we make it part of our contract, that local businesses um, are the ones who design and service and maintain these gardens and these rooftop and balcony forests. Um, creating enterprise is an um, expanded idea for our designs. And when you put all of these in the same design, say for a data center of the future, suddenly the not in my backyard conversation becomes please in my backyard. If you literally are making something that, is, that has a cascading amount of benefits going out of the boundaries, and it's, boy, it's not just a, an old, it's, it's not a, a, a building with a, with a parking lot and razor wire around it. This is beautiful Vancouver. I want you to imagine a thankful eco-region. Better off because we're there. We have gotten so guilt-ridden, right? It's hard to imagine that the watershed would be better with Vancouver there than without it. But that's what I'm asking us to imagine for this next stage of human design. So those, that's a big systems level look. But as I said, every single one of those big systems are made up of little things that make a difference, right? That are, that are designs. Your products, if you're in product design or apparel design. So I'm asking you, do your products do this? Do they do all of this? If you were to go right now at the design project that you're working on, 
Maybe it's a fan. How does my fan nurture biodiversity? What? Why should it? Why should it need to nurture biodiversity? Right? It might, at some time in its life, need to nurture biodiversity. It might need to be a soil amendment at the end of its life. So let's look at some, let's look at some other product uh, systems that do just this. This is Bren Smith of Trimble Creek Farms. It's greenwave.org is where you can learn about this. It's 3D farming that restores the ocean. So he is a farmer who is not, he's, it's not enclosed aquaculture. What he's actually doing is he's got lines of kelp which help to clean water and actually remove some of the acidification in the ocean at the same time. He's trying to get chefs to start to, to uh, serve this kelp um, along the East Coast, and they are. He can also grow oysters and scallops. Fish move in and can move out, so there's no enclosed plume, you know, enclosed group like factory farming of fish. It's a very, very different way to do farming, but if you look at his information and the studies that he's doing, he's trying to figure out how to restore the ocean while growing food. That's an expanded design brief. So also in food, one of the biggest you know, problems with, um, uh, with climate change, if, if food waste was a country, it would be the third largest emitter. Food waste, meaning you know, that includes everything we've done with food to, get to grow it to this point, and then also the methane, that, you know, methane once, it, once it starts to rot. So here's a, um, somebody who won our um, Ray of Hope Prize. Uh, he's a plant chemist. And he knew that um, plants will, when they're attacked, say a tomato plant is attacked by a worm, it'll put off a chemical like jasmonic acid. And that will, will cue another plant nearby to beef up their defenses against that particular pest. Well, fruit can also do this while it is in the bin after it has been picked. Um, so what he did was he went to his home country, he studied here in the States, Deepak, and he went back to his home country in India, and he's created a sachet that has a mimics of these chemicals, and it goes into a bin, and the tomatoes beef up their defenses against microbes and against spoilage. Um, and you can see the, the control, and um, they're decreasing food waste by 40 to 50%. And this is in places where, you know, it's a t two acres is a big farm in India. 400 acres is our average, but two acres, it, and you put your produce on a, on a train, and that train is in 95 degree weather with no refrigeration. So that's why 40 to 50 percent of the food and the income to the farmer was being lost. So here he's mimicking, he's mimicking plant signaling, but he's doing far more, he and his, he and his, um, his, his, you see his lab there. Um, how, do you, how does nature create color without pigments? So pigments, uh, toxic dyes, as you know, are one of the biggest problems, if you're, especially if you're in the apparel industry, you know about this. Um, life is very colorful. Things like morpho butterflies are extremely colorful. The reason they're colorful is not because of pigments. They're actually brown in color, these morphos. But what happens is they have particular nanostructures in their wings, scales. And when light goes through, some of it refracts back out in an amplified way to create blue. A few millimeters over, you change the design, you change the color. And um, this is a... Um, a company called Cypress Materials that won our, uh, was one of our Ray of Hope. Uh, these are actual companies I want to show you because this is now happening. It's no longer just in, uh, in research labs. Um, and this is a, a spray-on product that self-assembles into the, the structure that creates that kind of color, and they can also do it on windows to reflect uh, UV light, which is an, a building issue. Um, Here's one, titanium is in everything, titanium dioxide, which is, which is what creates the color white. It, from everything from toothpaste to pulp and paper, all white. Um, impossible Materials is taking waste cellulose, 
And what they did was they studied this little white beetle from Asia. And this beetle has fibers on its shell that are in a particular pattern that scatters light perfectly. <laughs> and they're taking cellulose and giving it that structure, that fibrous structure, that random fiber structure. It's creating white and their product is in a powdered form and it can be put into liquid. It literally is a titanium dioxide mining alternative. Um, here's another one for structural color, for anti-reflective coatings, for things like uh, spotless coatings, uh, like Lotus Effect. Instead of using a coating, they found a way to take lasers and emboss the coating onto a product. So imagine your next car doesn't really have a color, it just has a laser embossing a particular pattern on it that creates the color to your eye. Life doesn't heat, beat, and treat, right? It can't, the spider can't possibly do that because it's making its silk right in its own body. Here's another winner of our uh, Ray Hope Prize from last year. After all the work, and this is a, I'm going to put in a, a plug for basic research in biology. People have been studying to try to figure out how spiders make their webs for such a long time. And finally, what they're mimicking is not the material. They're mimicking the processing of the spinnerets, and they're able to take a waste stream of any material that's proteinous, and they're able to put it through a spinneret-like process to create spider silk strength. Um, here's photocatalytic chemistry. This is a, this is a platform um, technology. Instead of using heating and beating and treating, which is high heats and pressures and chemicals, you're using light to create bonds and break bonds as a catalysis. It's called new iridium because iridium is usually, is, is the toxic catalyst that's usually used. It replaces that. Um, CO2 in building materials, there's that polyp. And this is a company that takes the waste product from, from uh, desalination, which is brine, heav heavily mineralized water, and adds CO2 from smokestacks at Moss Landing. It's a company called Blue Planet. And if you go to the Harvey Milk SFO terminal um, in San Francisco, the concrete and aggregate is sequestering CO2 the way a coral reef does. So it's CO2 sequestering concrete. Decomposition. Uh, this is um, Francesca Bertsini. She um, is a beehive expert, and she was taking home some worms that eat bee wax in a bag as us biologists do. She put it on her kitchen counter. The, the bugs ate through the plastic very efficiently. So now there's a lot of people who are doing that. They're looking at under the piles of, of textiles that we have in places like Ghana, and they're looking for the critters that already are figuring out how to break down polypropylene and polyethylene, which is what most of our fabrics are. We've got a, a, a uh, 25 million euro project right now uh, where we're piloting some of these biomimetic decomposition technologies to see how they do in the global south and in uh, Berlin and Amsterdam. It's called Design for Decomposition. Uh, circular economy, life is the original circular economy. Uh, how does nature circulate materials? Um, the industrial ecology work that I talked about in the book, in which we have food, we have companies co-located together in sort of a food web, feeding off of each other's waste products. Those are now, we're, big, we're beginning to put the ecology back in industrial ecology. Because we're, there are scientists at uh, Georgia Tech, and I just came back from uh, Townsend University to talk to Brian Fath. These are people who have studied food webs. Now they're looking at industrial ecologies, and they're saying, are those industrial ecologies as efficient, as cyclic, as the food webs? And they're not. They're really ecologies in name only. And they, they're able to, to basically just assess how good, a, how good a municipality is, say, at circulating all its materials, and using a food web 
mo um, measure, they're able to tell them what they need. And guess what they mostly need? They're missing decomposer class. Purifying water, this is uh, Aquaporin, which is a, a company that uses literally uh, pores that you have in every cell of your body that uh, pull water through while leaving everything else behind. It's called forward osmosis. Um, reducing energy use, life is very good at this. Um, John DeBerry of Windspear Energy has studied how fish flock to get, uh, swim together and basically, they basically um, surf off the vortices of the fish in front of them in order to swim upstream. And he's taken this and put vertical axis wind, wind turbines in combination such that the first turbine spins, creates vortices, and the rest of them start to spin, which increases energy by 10 times. <laughs> Envirogrid does the same thing with flocks and swarms, only it turns it into, it turns it into software that allows appliances to talk to each other and optimize their energy use. This is a brine shrimp that dries out almost entirely, and there's a tardigrade, um, and people are learning how to wrap tiny time capsules of trehalose. Um, these critters can dry out, and we're doing the same thing now with with uh, vaccines. What this does is it stops the need for freezers or refrigerators. When it goes from lab to village, we usually lose half of our vaccines. Half of the people don't get their vaccines. And this is changing that. And light weighting, obviously this is a Boeing. Um, there's bone optimization software in almost every, in Dassault, if you work with engineering software, if you work with Autodesk, they all have bone optimization software, which is allowing us to do uh, very, very strong designs uh, by taking material where it's not needed and putting it where it is needed. And that's based on bones. Um, these are some wind turbines that have been lightweighted by this little mantis shrimp and the way it's club has such strength and uh, impact resistance for weight. So the question is, you know, you've seen, I could go on and on with these examples. And for those of you who don't think that you're designers, um, I kind of think that we design our lives as well. I think we are all designers in some way. And we really emphasize three things in biomimicry that emulate that I've told you a, a lot about the ethos, which I told you a lot about today, but also the reconnect and getting people outside and getting them reconnected to the natural world is the first step. You can't ask nature unless you're aware of this. Um, we use something called life's principles, which is an eco design checklist of what all organisms have in common it's kind of best practices for earthlings. Um, so we're not just taking an organism's blueprint and then doing whatever chemistry we want to create it, right? We also have to put it through this other filter of how would life manufacture it. We work sometimes in social innovation, looking at the literature around mutualisms and how they, how organisms establish them and maintain mutually beneficial relationships. What's the etiquette of mutualisms? My friend David Orr from Oberlin, you guys might know him. Um, he says the best way, the first thing you have to do if you want a sustainable or regenerative society is create a culture that desires one. So I've been thinking a lot these days, not about goals, design goals, but I've been thinking about vows, <laughs> aspirational vows, which a lot of these ecological performance standards I was telling you about, they're quite aspirational. But a vow, a vow is different than a goal. It's, it's kind of a, something that is more centered in your soul or comes from your soul. And, a, and vows define a culture. A vow would be the thing that you 
dis decided when you were going to design school, you, maybe you had some awe-inspiring experience in the natural world. You know, you came face to face with a, with a whale snorkeling and you had one of those ion experiences. And you whispered to yourself in my, on my watch, in my design career, I'm gonna make sure that you get to live here for a very long time. That's a vow. We whisper vows to ourselves. And I know you all have those. How do we as a culture all decide what we desire? 1939 World's Fair was in Chicago. A third of our country went to it. A third of our country. This is before cars were around. There was a, I mean, cars were, were around, but they weren't mass, you know, passenger vehicles. Um, this was the GE exhibit. It was the exhibit where you got a, you got a little uh, button that said, um, I've seen the future. <laughs> and what it was was a diorama. And it was a ride. See the people on the ride? And they went around this diorama. Those buildings are about like waist height. And it was GM, it was, it was a, a car manufacturer, and that was the city that a third of America saw. That was not the way cities looked, but it was an aspirational goal. And that's what we did. We are actually really, really good once we change our desires at doing that very thing. So I ask you, what are you gonna dream of? What's your 1939 World Fair design exhibition gonna be? That's gonna set somebody's heart on fire and say, yeah, I, 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 wanna, I wanna live in a place like that. I wanna live in a place like that. Let's remember that it's, even though there's this rhetorical thing I have to do when I'm like, we're learning from nature as if we're not nature, we are nature and that's why biomimicry works. And that's why you have a longing to do the things that you saw here and to live in the ways that you saw of all those cities I showed you. That's what unites us. A, a desire to fit in here, meaning unites us with other organisms as well. Incredibly young species, remember. But a competent planet that we've been built, we've been, we've been born to. And we are not aliens here. We have competent elders. This is the thankfulness part. And all of them have a design brief. It's just one criteria for success, one shared purpose. And the measure of success is this, is it good for life? That nest, it's a failure unless the chicks fare well. How will the chicks fare here is literally the only question for that nest. But that nest is going to then drop and become part of that habitat that's going to take care of that generation and generations, 10,000 generations from now. So what life does is it creates conditions conducive to life. And I don't think that's too big of a design brief. I think it's essential. And I think it's possible because our true home is there, here. And I think our true nature is generous. That's my field. Whatever part of the earth you touch, you can heal. Thank you very much.
Every time I hear Janine speak, it's inspiring, it's mind-boggling, it's amazing, and I hope you all feel the same way. Thank you, Janine, for this remarkable, remarkable talk. Always such a pleasure. Uh, may I now invite Dr. Sharang Priya and Dr. Emily snell -Root to join us on the stage. We now uh, switch into the panel discussion for this evening. I shall quickly introduce uh, Dr. Shashank Priya and Dr. Emily snell -Root. I have a few questions here that I'll ask, ask of the panel, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience as well. Uh, Dr. Shashank Priya, um, is, uh, he serves as the University of Minnesota's Vice President of Research, a role he assumed in September of last year, 2022. In this position, he oversees over a billion dollars of research across all campuses and facilities of the university. He manages units responsible for administration of sponsored projects, research and regulatory compliance, and technology commercialization, as well as 10 interdisciplinary academic centers and institutes. He also oversees a growing corporate engagement portfolio for the university. Dr. Priya's own research is focused on three topical areas, multifunctional materials such as piezoelectrics and multiferroics, energy harvesting such as solar cells and thermoelectrics, and one of the primary reasons why he's here on stage with us, bio-inspired robotics by looking at jellyfish and millipedes. Thank you, Dr. Priya. I'll also introduce Dr. Emily snell -Rood. Uh, Emily snell -Rood is Professor of Ecology, Evolution and Behavior, and also the Associate Head of the Department uh, in the College of Biological Sciences at the University of Minnesota. Uh, Dr. snell -Rood is primarily interested in the evolution of learning, and she focuses on topics such as the costs of learning and information acquisition, and the role of developmental timing and nutrition as constraints on the evolution of learning. Her lab studies why organisms vary in their response to novel environments, um, for instance, due to learning or general stress responses. This understanding is used to inform efforts related to conservation, such as restoration of road sides, road sides or urban green spaces. Emily is interested in bridges between biology and design and engineering through educational efforts to bring more biology into bio-inspired design. She actually teaches a course in biomimicry at the university, which has students from biology, design, and engineering. All right, welcome to all the panelists. Thank you for being here. Uh, I'll start with a question to Janine. Janine, you have been involved for decades in this work in, in biomimicry. Um, May I ask you, how has your thinking sort of evolved over the last several decades, um, and where do you see the future of this discipline? You know, I, I, I hear myself um, telling you how possible it is, right? Um, and I, when the book first came out, I had no idea that there would be any response to it whatsoever. Um, you know, I had written several natural history books and, you know, your parents read them. You're, you know, I mean, it's, you know, they're not, they're not like blockbuster books. But what happened here did surprise me and so it's, it's made my thinking really change. Um, I thought it would be, you know, I wrote, I wrote about bench scientists doing this work and I hoped that research funding would go to them as a result of giving this field a name, a, a, a common name, a common framework. And I pretty much thought that it would be decades of research. Um, and what happened was companies started to call and say, can you bring your biologist to the design table? And I didn't have any, um, I didn't have any biologists. I mean, I, I did, there, was no, there was no field. So this has been a demand-driven field and what it made me realize is that the sustainability movement had gotten to a point where it had a stranglehold on the problem space, but it needed a solution space. And so biomimicry represented that. And, and I think my, my thinking then moved to completely to that solution space. And whenever I did deal with problems or staff that we have now deal with problems, environmental problems that are out there, we're instantly 
you know, we have a list of sustainability speed bumps and problems, and then we are looking for solutions constantly, constantly. And that evolved my thinking as an environmentalist because we were all sort of stuck in that, in that problem space. Um, and now I think everywhere I look, I look for solutions only. And everywhere, now, now in the natural world, that's what I see when I look. Um, in terms of where this is going, um, we, we've tried to democratize it because we realize that, you know, one small company doing this work, even with a lot of, lot of large companies, is not enough. So what we did was, and that's why we work it, we have a two-year master's course at ASU and an 18-month course, and a, uh, we have the Center for Biomimicry there, and, and hopefully we'll do something at U of M, too. And um, we have a graduate, um, an undergraduate course, too. And the people that, the hundreds of people that have gone through, and now thousands going through that program, we, in, we teach to do exactly what we're doing. And so they're going back to their countries, and we've got 39 regional hubs around the world where people who are our, um, our graduates of this are now doing the same thing we're doing. And that means they're walking into companies. And that means your students who are doing bio-inspired design projects are getting hired by them as, you know, that's where I see it going. It's, it's becoming it's becoming not a, a, an exceptional thing, but rather institutionalized, which is, which is great. Now, democratized, um, we've got to ask nature through the Institute, and we do design challenges, and you saw some of the winners. But ask nature is to democratize it, meaning not everybody's going to have a consultant, not everybody's going to have the ability to go to a university, but it, they're designing. And, if, and at the moment of creation, they should have access to ask, what would nature do here? So we started Ask Nature in 2008. Well, now, with AI, I mean, chat nature is next. So the next stage of democratization here you know, where Ask Nature, we were able to see, you put in how does nature filter salt from water and you'd learn about membranes of, you know, nasal glands of seabirds and penguins and things like that. But you'd have to read all those papers yourself. And now I see it more as a design concierge where you will be, you'll go online with chat nature and say, I'm designing this. And It'll help you walk through the method that brings you to function, and then it'll bring up the papers, and, and when it gets better, believe me, it hallucinates too much right now. I don't let my folks use it. Um, but when it gets better, I think we're going to come for a time when, when it's going to answer those questions that the designer has, because the problem has always been designers are not biologists. And it's been this multidisciplinary bridge that we've been trying to bridge by doing teams, and you're always going to have teams, but it's really going to be helpful if people designing are able to use chat, chat nature. And by the same point, biologists are able to know what designers want by asking the same sorts of things. So I think that's where it's, that's where it's going in the next 10 years, hopefully. Um. So I'd like to turn to Shashank. Uh, Shashank, can you talk about your own interest and work um, in biological inspired design? Uh, I think you have a few slides you'd like to show about some of your work. Uh, if you can have Shashank's slides up, I'll get to the remote. Oh, you have the remote. I think it works, it works from here, so I can explain. First of all, Janine, that was beautiful talk, so thank you very much for, for coming here and giving us this inspiring talk. Um, so I, I actually had a few minutes, four or five minutes, so I wanted to select an example that probably you saw all the time, but, but didn't ask the question, like what is the unique about this? And jellyfish is like 95% water, maybe about four or 5% body mass. But it does unbelievable things, which probably you have not seen before. So that was my goal, just select an example that can surprise you today. Jellyfish has the lowest cost of transport. Cost of transport means uh, amount of energy required to move a mass by certain velocity. 
and it has the best cost of transport compared to everything, cheetah, lion, uh, Tesla car, or whatever, right? <laughs> so, and you ask question like, why? Um, why an organism which is 5% body mass can do this? And they take advantage of, I won't go into all physics, but vertices. So you see these two circulating vertices which are shred from their peripheral column. And these vertices circulate water around them. Right. And this water creates a jet which pushes the umbrella forward. So on this slide, there's a lot of fluid dynamics here. But in simple terms, just like your umbrella in your home, and you op an open or close umbrella using your hand, just imagine that action is being done by water jet. And that jet is being created just by movement of the bell. So bell is expanding and shrinking, expanding and shrinking. And it's all, that's all pretty much. And so we were able to create uh, that simple organism in the lab, so it's called misoglia, but at the, at the edge of this jellyfish, you will see a small, very flexible skin. Um, that skin is vortex generator. I mean, it's a very simple solution. It's almost like attaching a flap at the end of an umbrella, and that flap moves around in the water and creates two vortices, uh, one on the upswing and one on the downswing, and that's pretty much it and it pushes the jellyfish forward. So very simple solution nature created. And we were able to take that and create vehicles like this, uh, which are self-powered and can move around in the water and basically do all kinds of actions like sensing or, or detecting something and so on. Okay, so uh, I'll give another example and pass it on to Emily. Uh, Inside the jellyfish, if you cut it, if you take it inside the scanning electron microscope and you start cutting it, you will find this organ is called statocyst. And inside the statocyst are these calcium sulfate balls. So what does statocyst do? It is a three-dimensional tilt sensor. For example, if you're moving in a three-dimension and you say, I want to grab a food which is at 20-degree angle, how does jellyfish know how to move 20 degree angle? That, that decision is made by this organ called sterocyst. Inside the sterocyst are these calcium sulfate balls. Now, it's a ceramic material, and you'd say, how, how do you produce these circular balls of ceramic inside the jellyfish in the water? When you are in the ocean, it's a, it's a room temperature almost, and, and you require 1,000 degrees C in order to make this kind of material. Um, but let's say you produce it somehow. This, uh, this uh, calcium balls are inside this cavity, as shown there. And on the side of the cavities are the hair cells. So as you tilt around, the ball basically touches the hair cell, and, and there's a reference, on, a reference hair cell, and you basically know how many hairs are between the reference cell and the, where the ball is touching, and that gives you the angle. And so we were able to take that and basically design a, a tilt sensor, as shown here, and, and installed it on the drones and basically allowed the drones to fly uh, autonomously so that they can decide the direction in which they have to fly. So very simple, cheap solutions, but from, from jellyfish. So next time you see jellyfish, maybe you can, you can think about a few things uh, instead of walking over it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Shashank. Uh, Emily, I was delighted to hear that you are already teaching a course in biomimicry, um, and you have biologists, engineers, and designers in your class. Uh, would you mind talking about your own research? I think you have a few slides as well. Yes, thank you so much. And it's really an honor and, uh, to be here up on the stage with all of you. Uh, thank you for having me. And I first learned about biomimicry from a couple of popular science books in 2011, including your wonderful book, Janine. And I, my first thought was, wow, this, so I'm a biologist by training. And like many biologists, I'm obsessed with some weird groups of animals like dung beetles and birds. And people are always like, why are you collecting dung and working on dung beetles? And now I have an answer because you never know in 
40 or 50 years what that might lead to. And so I sort of instantly thought, well, the p potential here to use this as a lens to teach biology is huge. And so in 2012, I started teaching a class on bio-inspired design and learning, learning about it and since um, expanded that into a couple of classes focused on bio-inspired design, but also now teach my regular biology classes through a bio-inspired design lens. So I love the statistics example. I'm currently teaching animal diversity and I teach it, so basically zoology, and I teach it through a bio-inspired design lens and we talk about statuses and jellyfish and a lot of it's framed as like, here's the basic biology, but you never know where it's gonna take you. Um, but anyway, and as I started to delve into the field of bio-inspired design and looking at who is using this approach in engineering and physics and design, uh, I noticed that a lot of the people using this approach, a lot of the professionals and researchers using this approach were doing it without biologists, which, you know, is fine, but it's not really unleashing the full power of bio-inspired design because there are all of these branches of the tree of life that we're missing. There are certain sort of misconception of misconceptions of biology, nuances of biology that we're missing. There are all of these things that we could do better if we had biologists more involved and through the whole process. And so in uh, 2016, I actually quantified this in a commentary at that time in 2015 when I took the data, fewer than 10% of studies involving research using bio-inspired design and engineering and other fields actually involved biologists in the, in the collaboration, which is shocking. It's a bio-inspired design, so where are the biologists? And so this really framed a lot of my interest in this area, uh, both in, with respect to research and teaching. And, uh, and I started, a, expanded in the teaching space and then I started a bunch of collaborations with people to try to address some of these issues. Uh, when you step back from it for a second though and really think about it, you can't really fault the engineers and designers though for kind of staying back from biology because biology is overwhelming in and of itself. If you think about, you know, the jargon involved and all of the classes you need to take to be a biology major, do you have to, you know, move from being an engineer or designer to being a biology major? No, not necessarily. But so biology is overwhelming from a jargon perspective, but it's also overwhelming from a biodiversity perspective. We have 2 million described species, probably 10 to 30 million total, total species in existence, each with thousands of genes and hundreds of traits. That is a huge amount of information. It's overwhelming to a biologist, much less a designer. So one of the things that we've been doing to try to facilitate this interdisciplinarity is by uh, sort of distilling pieces of biology, what are the essential pieces of biology that a designer needs in order to use a bio-inspired design process. And so working with some collaborators, including Dmitry Smirnov, who's in the audience, we've been working on a series of modules called Biology for Biomimetics. Uh, this is a figure from one of those, uh, from the first paper in that series, which is sort of basic concepts from biology. Here, this is talking about function. What is function in biology? How do you use function as a bridge between biology and the analogies that you're making in design? And how does understanding function in biology lead to a more nuanced understandings of possible trade-offs in copying a biological trait? So this is one example, but we have a whole series of examples of sort of core concepts in biology for biomimetics that we're working on here. And throughout this, we are testing this, sort of implement, rolling it out in classroom settings as well, and iteratively through a design process, I guess, of the process itself, uh, changing and making things better as we test them in the classroom and seeing what works and what totally doesn't work. And so we're doing this both in classrooms that are structured on bio-inspired design, where students are, like in this picture, actually drawing out designs for bio-inspired products and also making prototypes and testing them, but also in more traditional biology classrooms that are flipped to go through a bio-inspired design lens. And so there we can also test specific interventions to, uh, focused on more specific problems in the process. Just an example here is that when you ask someone, okay, brainstorm a bunch of animals for a problem, we are often you know, there's so many organisms out there. We are drawn to things we are familiar with. Uh, we are drawn to charismatic megafauna that we see on TV. Uh, we are drawn to things like squirrels and dogs and humans and birds. And so that's in the upper graph, an example from one of our activities. So how can we use AI or internet search tools or other interventions to expand out to search all over the tree of life for ideas because the more things, more ideas, more biological models you look at, the better range, the greater diversity of ideas you're gonna get. And so that's the lower graph there in that word cloud from that classroom intervention. Um, 
we're working on this outside of the classroom space as well. So I'm working with a whole group of uh, not just biologists and educators, but also designers um, in the College of Design, especially in architecture and landscape architecture. Um, I'm working with some folks in robotics and um, engineering as well. But then our, our group also includes philosophers and historians. We're funded by the Templeton Foundation to, uh, to do work, research on the bio-inspired design process. And we're testing that in our own process as well. So just one example here, we're doing using sort of bio-inspired design applied to this building space in one of our buildings. It's really dark, dingy basement space with really poor lighting, asking, well, could we take a bio-inspired design approach to this and also test our principles at the same time? And one piece of that that I'm particularly excited about because I love insects um, is exploring some of these super white pyarid butterflies, some of which are low, um, low light uh, rainforest forest floor specialists uh, and asking, well, how, in this case, it's not, it's, it's a pigment combined with structure. And so how one sort of research direction here is how they do that. Could you use that, roll that out in, in a lighting challenge like, like that we're working on. And so, um, I'll end by just saying all of our efforts as a collaborative group, we're building these tools to sort of focus on the bioinspired design process uh, and throughout try to bring biology and more biologists throughout the design process um, so that we can tap more biological models, uh, also understand the nuance and limitations of biology more, um, and just in general, uh, have more biology in design and engineering and all over the all over the world, I guess. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Well, before we open up the the floor to the audience for questions, I think I'll ask one question of uh, all three of you. Uh, Emily, clearly you're doing teaching and research in this space. Shashank, you're doing this as well. Janine, you've seen this done at uh, often many other universities, including ASU. So the question is, what are some of the challenges in doing this kind of work, teaching and research in biological inspired design, biomimicry at a university? And how can we expand that to include a lot more participants in this work? Uh, so I'll just ask that to the three panelists, and I'll open it up to questions from the audience. All right, I have many thoughts on this. I'll try to keep it brief. Um, so I, I guess I'll highlight two challenges. Um, one is something that Janine already touched on, the fact that in order to make true leaps and innovations in biomimetics, you need a really strong base of basic research. And that's hard when you have two million species, two million described species. Um, the spider silk example being one where there's decades of basic research on spider silk protein, spider morphology, spider diversity, and only now, you know, we're starting to get products out of it. And there's been a lot of frustration in the, in the more applied world about like, well, this idea has been around for a while. Why don't we have a product yet? Um, and that's because biology is complicated and basic research takes time. And so how do we set up a structure of funding research and supporting basic research? Is that looking at more use-inspired basic research? Is it restructuring the funding of research? I don't know. Um, I'd love to hear ideas from some of you guys about that. And then the other thing that I'll mention briefly is because bio-inspired design is inherently interdisciplinary, you cannot do it within one college. And so from a teaching perspective, there are challenges here where the budget model and funding model is often set up in a college-specific way, but there are teaching, there are courses like the Grand Challenges courses, which are set up to overcome that budget, budget model and have interdisciplinary teaching across colleges. And so that kind of, how can we invest in that uh, sort of interdisciplinary process and support that more? So that would be what I would challenge, uh, highlight. Okay. I'll be short sure too. So um, I think Emily and, and Janine both described this interdisciplinary nature that you need knowledge from biology or material science and mechanical engineering, et cetera. All this combined together in order to do so. So one way is to form team, but uh, as a PhD student or master's student, you are trying to do a lot of things by yourself, and it could be a time-taking process to solve all the challenges by yourself. And so, so what, what we have seen is, um, first of all, the students are really excited to work in this area, to, to make robots that can fly or crawl, or uh, they just love it. And, but I think if we can provide them tools like, like AI tools, let's say chat nature, or 
provide them tools that basically translate the language from one discipline into simple English, I think that will be very, very helpful to advance and make the progress in this type of research. Yes, but as two. Um, um, one of them is that is that um, where we put a lot of emphasis was um, on molecular biology, and we were really excited about it. As you know, and the, as the modern synthesis came along, and then we understood about DNA and the Human Genome Project. A lot of money and a lot of buildings are molecular biology and genetics buildings and that's great and we need to keep doing that. But we almost did an either or thing. Uh, David Ehrenfeld uh, has a great essay called Forgetting in which we let a lot of um, organismal science and uh, go, go let, we let go of it. it there was, there's a period in which we, we literally stopped having insurance for field research in biology. Organismal biology at the level of organism is often who you need to talk to w about these bio-inspired, these mechanisms and strategies. And then also at the level of ecology, now we're looking at those kinds of strategies as well. Um, and so it doesn't, it doesn't mean we stop doing molecular biology. In fact, that can help us. You know, that, that is part of this, the basic research that helps us. But we need to have those organismal biologists back in the mix and we need to be training people in organismal biology. And then there's another field called the taxonomists. It's like, it's like Quentin Wheeler, right? Um, a, a, a mutual friend of ours. These are the people who study um, groups of organisms and how they relate to one another and they do comparative biology, for instance. And so they're such an important part of this because you can say who makes white in the natural world and a taxonomist might be able to tell you what families of moths have white and different kinds of white. I mean, they're very, they're at that aggregated level of, of specialty, right? Where they, where they sort of have the feel, they've got the, they've got the telephone book of a lot of species. So you can see how you, how you need that. For instance, when you were talking about the spider, work. All of those decades of work, 98% of that was on one species. The orb weaver spider became our model. And there are tens of thousands of species of spider. Did we choose the right one? Right? So when next time you hear, a, hear somebody, you know, say, why, why should we be in the jungle trying to name and identify and, and all of the species, it's because that library is richer for, for biomimicry when it is as complete as we can possibly make it. Because the best biomimetic, the, the biomimetic method works best when you come up with a function and then you look what we call amoeba through zebra. So you say, how does nature repel water? You know, our clients come to us and want to know how nature repels water, not with perforinated compounds, you know, not with forever chemicals, just they don't. But we look amoeba through zebra, we look at bacteria, we look at across taxa. So we look at bacteria, how does fungi do it? How do plants do it? How do mammals do it? How do birds do it, right? Because then what, you've, what you get, you don't settle too soon on a particular model organism, but rather you get all these mechanisms and then you start to say, what are the pa deep patterns here? across the tree of life. Um, so I'm a big proponent of, you know, having as much money go into these sorts of um, biological endeavors as, as, as we've put into molecular biology, like bring our microscope out and do the macroscope now and the organismal. Um, yay. <laughs> I know. Don't you want to just cheer? Me too. Thank you, Janine. I, I said my piece. I should go on. <laughs> Let's open up the, uh, the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, Alana has a microphone here. I have another one. We have one at the podium here. So questions from the audience. Uh, thank you all for your time. I've got a question that 
If I could jump back to earlier in Janine's presentation, though it's a question for all of you. Janine, you were highlighting uh, some keystone species early on. And I'm curious, in your work over the years, what are the keystone learning moments that you've seen with individuals and groups to kind of integrate this mindset? And then culturally, as we're thinking forward, what are these keystone or these watershed actions that we need, right? Like research, policy, innovation. Does it go beyond that? Um, so what's the learning insights that individuals and groups need? And then thinking ahead, culturally, what are the components that you feel like are really going to create these quantum leaps? Yeah, I, I, that's great, great deep questions. Thank you. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of people who are very surprised when they're actually introduced to how life works. Um, and that the things they've been chasing their whole career from, you know, a, a challenge they've been chasing has already been solved in the natural world. You know, I have a, this a story I tell about going on a, on the Galap to the Galapagos with a group of wastewater treatment engineers. Corolo engineers, and I, I wound up um, really, I watched the epiphany happen. We call it muddy knees and epiphanies because people just, when they finally realize, at first they were really resistant, like why are we on this boondoggle? And then I said, well, what do you do for a living? And they said, we filter stuff out of water. And I said, let's go snorkeling because everything in this ocean is living on fresh water, but it's living in salt water. So there's a lot of filtering going on here. And they had never thought of that at all. And I, I, I went and stood next to a, a guy, I, I came upon him on a trail on one of the islands, and he was actually crying. And he was a pretty buttoned up guy, he was a, a, he was a desalination expert. And he was looking at a mangrove. And he said, I'm here, this is a, this is a solar powered desalination plant, a plant with its, <laughs> roots in the salt water, and it's desalinating water using the sun. And he said, I'm crying because it's beautiful, and I'm crying because nobody ever told me it. I never learned it in school. So I think culturally, one of the simple things to, where you could have that aha moment in university is if before you took, say you're a mechanical engineer, and before you take mechanical engineering, you take a bi biology, uh, an engineering for biology, a biology for engineering class, and say, in, you know, like instead of learning how industrial pumps are made, learn how a whale heart pumps blood over miles and miles of veins and arteries with biochemicals. And it, once you learn that first, then you go and you're introduced to an internal combustion engine, you might have questions about it. Or what you said about, you know, the jellyfish. You might say, wait a minute, why are we doing propulsion like this? We don't need to, like, the, we can do something that uses, you know, the surface tension of the water or whatever, the power of the water to help us make that vortex. I think that that's where the aha would happen by design instead of by me, me by accident on the Galapagos Islands with these guys. Here we go. Um, I am really inspired by everything I've heard, um, especially um, ideas related to thinking differently about what design is, what are we designed for, um, and this um, idea of generosity that um, is, to me, the ethos of, of of um, bio-inspired design. I'm also wondering if we are moving forward as a general goal, um, should we also change our definition of design? And I'm also thinking, how, has there been any sort of resistance in terms of, in certain design industries, what the end goals are to produce more things or innovations to sell more things or, you know, this um, uh, notion of creating more and, and, and generating profit. 
it seems um, that it could be contradictory at some point if we're really thinking about design um, with generosity and, and changing what we design and, and why we design. Um, I wonder if there's a moment where we should be rethinking our disciplines from, from the core and is that one of the challenges that any of you have faced um, in any of the areas that you've um, experienced? Um, applying this ethos? Um, I'll just say a couple of things about this. Um, I think uh, what happens in many design disciplines is there are trade-offs, even, even engineering, in, in business practice. There are multiple forces that drive design forces, business forces, engineering work in different directions. And sometimes it's a question of how do we deal with these trade-offs. So one of the things we are doing at, um, at Arizona State is working on a model of innovation that we refer to as integrated innovation which we ask four key questions. What's, what's valuable to people? What's um, profitable to the corporation? What's feasible via engineering? And what's good for society and the environment? And we thought true innovation happened when you're able to somehow answer all four questions. So it's kind of a small dot if you think of a Venn diagram. But there are always sort of competing forces. You mentioned kind of the push and pull. Um, uh, but it's a question of how do, we, how do we try to find balance between those? Uh, and when you start with a sort of a biomimetic perspective, when you start by looking at nature, trying to find an organism, an ecosystem, a structure that works, your starting point for design is entirely different. And I think it, that itself leads you in a direction where you end up with solutions that are a lot more sustainable than if you had, hadn't started from that point of view. Yeah, I can, I, I can give another example for this. So um, one time we were... So, so we all make these uh, sensors and different kinds of devices which are powered by batteries. So if you imagine you want to put hundreds of sensors around this room, you, have, you will have hundreds of places to change batteries. And who's going to change these batteries, right? So we ask question that th this is not how all these insects and other organisms are doing. There's no, they're creating power directly from sunlight or the food that they are eating in and so on. And, and this led us to design some really cool things. Um, one was we were able to convert stress, so you press something directly into light. And so this material glows. And, and so this bypasses the idea of converting a stress into some kind of electricity and storing in a battery and then powering a light you directly go from stress to light. And now stress can be found very easily in the environment, right? So when you walk, you are stressing a floor. When you're driving a car, you are stressing the road. Uh, wind, when it's flowing, it's stressing the structure. So you can find stress very easily and then you can convert. So I think there are, there are problems that push you to find solution, which is almost impossible in the artificial world to think about it because it doesn't, work, the, nature, the materials that we know about and the design principles that we know about, they can provide that ideal solution. Uh, but there are examples in nature that have solved that similar problem. So, uh, so I think there are some really good examples. Uh, one, of, one of my favorites is how do you convert one degree temperature into electricity? For example, if you rub your hand for a minute, your hand will get hot. If you touch it, that surface starts to produce electricity. And it will be very hard to conceive, uh, like sitting here, like, oh, is this possible? But there are, there are uh, organisms that do this. They convert one degree temperature differential into electricity. And we are able, to, somehow we are able to copy that in our machines and it provides us a new energy source for, for heat energy harvesting. So I think these type of creativity is inspired by by things that we can't imagine based on the known laws and known materials. Um, that's a really good example of how, you know, it is true that in the natural world, there are these constraints and limits. And one of the ways, and you know, for instance, um, one of the scientists that I, I wrote about in the book that was looking at, at, at ceramics, self-assembling ceramics, and an abalone shell, I asked him why he started doing that. And he said because there was the energy crisis 
and his supervisor came to him and said, can you make ceramics without a kiln? And he had to go to the natural world. And it's, what we ask of our designs is the designer's job, it's also the customer's job, right? So you can create these constraints to get the right kind of design. And we see that, for instance, in food choice. We now say, I want organic. That's a, that's a constraint that we put, and now the suppliers have to go and find that. There really has to be some sort of a, a pull, a desire, or a pressure to create the kind of design that, that we want, right? Because the profit motive, as it's set up right now, is not necessarily going to do it. Although, you can find ways. People say, well, how are you getting people like Microsoft or Ford to do this ecosystem service provision from their data centers? Why would they do that? Well, what we found, and this was a, a two-year student, uh, Caitlin Chusey, one of our two-year students actually works there, and she did the math for Microsoft and found out that they weren't able to build their data centers in communities. Nobody wanted them. And she added up what it was costing them for a day of not having an open data center. And when it went on to week, for weeks or for months, how much that actually cost. So in some ways, you can take that profit motive and you can kind of turn it on its head and say, you know, what corporations call it is the social license to operate. We don't have the social license to operate, meaning we don't have the social agreement that says you can build a data center here. And in order to do that, we now have to design differently. And we have to not put up razor wire and floodlights in the middle of a beautiful tulip field in the Netherlands. People don't want it. So how else are you going to do it? And that's an opening for a new kind of design. Right? So sometimes it's the constraints of how do you do this without a lot of electricity, or, and sometimes it's how do you do this so that it's where, because the kinds of design that I was talking about it makes a lush and a livable place for people to live. Social justice becomes the reason for doing this kind of work, right? Beyond your boundaries. It's who, it's who, it's because th that goodness goes out to the neighborhood next door. So all those social movements, I think that they also create the opening for, the, for this more beautiful design that, that we know is right. Hi there, I'm Gina. I appreciate the um, inspiring ideas you're throwing out here tonight, and I've long been inspired by you, Janine. Um, I am a former real estate developer, regretting a lot of the materials I selected along the way. Thankfully, it was for affordable housing, so it had a social justice bent. Um, I somehow now run a, a lead a team of researchers and scientists and toxicologists, and I have found that you all have so many more answers than um, we believe. And one of the biggest sciences missing in this work is social science. And you've been alluding to it in some different ways, you know, taking people to the ocean, seeing different things in this last story about social justice, et cetera. How are you integrating the social science and working with people to get the behavior change? Because oftentimes it's these human organisms that are that are getting in the way of actually getting something done that you all know is possible. Thank you, that's a great question. And um, I'll just offer, so a part of my life is related to bioinspired design, but a big part of my current research efforts actually have to do with urban ecology and sort of urban biology. And I'm part of a big group of people looking, doing long-term ecological research in the Twin Cities, and we have a lot of social scientists involved in that because to understand the urban ecosystem, you cannot understand that without the human element, uh, both with respect to thinking about the current status quo, but also how you want to change that. Um, I'm very interested in 
so just one example in response to your question, which kind of relates to this, is talking about green infrastructure and how do you get general acceptance for green infrastructure. And one big question that we've been working on there is how do you move from lawns, which is a huge percentage of, I don't know, 5% of the land use in the US or 1%, I can't remember, some still a huge amount. Um, how do you make lawns less bad than they are? But there's a huge social barrier to that. Um, and I've experienced that living in the suburbs, converting our right of way to a pollinator planting. But there is research on it and doing, making things look taken care of is what is, makes it more socially acceptable. So putting up a sign and mowing around the edge are like, those are two things you can do. Um, and then once you get to a certain threshold of like, well, 10% of the people in the neighborhood look different and then, then it becomes more acceptable. So, um, but I think you could say that for any of these green infrastructure initiatives, anything that's different or weird or looks unkempt or, because if, it, if it's different, then it, then it has all these other social implications. And so if we're talking about the spread of that in cities and redesigning cities, we absolutely need to have that social element. At what point do people become open to experimenting, especially if it takes, if it's more labor intensive, more costly, how do you provide incentives to that? So like the BLON program is one way that has been working. Um, and yeah, I could go on and on, but I'll stop there and see if any, any other people want to talk about it, but great, great point. There is a, a new lobe of biomimicry. I told you it was demand driven, you know, and a, and a lot of people are coming to us um, asking about social innovation and what can biomimicry teach social innovators. Now, I'll give you a caveat that that, that can be a slippery slope. It was called social Darwinism. A misreading of Darwin was used to, to justify some, some pretty horrific um, treatment of people and eugenics. So I myself am very careful about how we do that. And so we don't say, okay, let's teach people how to be ants because we're not ants or how to be bees or how to be lions. We're not. But what we do is we, if you look at the right scale, like if you look at the ecosystem scale and how communities of, how, how communities of organisms um, get into mutualistic relationships, for instance, that becomes something that can be studied as a pattern, mutualism, you know, why does it, why, how does it come about in a community of organisms and, a, and a, a, you know, across species? And how is it maintained? And why don't, why aren't there cheat, why isn't there cheating? And mutualism can be a very interesting topic for, so, for biomimicry, for social innovation. Other, other kinds of things are how does nature network? What are the best networks, for instance, for, um, disseminating information. How does nat nature forms these amazing networks and they, they have certain topologies, uh, meaning certain architectures that allow messages to be spread very quickly, say, across mycorrhizal nets in the, in the forest, right? Um, can we learn anything from that about how to set up our own social networks? Yes, in fact, I think we can. So there, are, there is biomimicry for social innovation and, and you've got people coming to our classes now who are um, social innovators who are, you know, asking those kinds of questions. How does nature cooperate? How does nature do mutualisms? How does, what, what is reciprocality in nature? You know, those kinds of questions. It's interesting. And we do it with, with great, you know, with great caution of um, the right scale to look at it so that we abstract it at the level of, of, of patterns that make sense. Perhaps one more question uh, and then we can wrap it up. One more question. I see someone in the back there. I will be thinking about this evening for some time, so thank you about that. Um, Sandy Stone from the ACT lab at the University of Texas in Austin once said that as soon as we can put a label on something, it is old news. And I'm wondering if you agree with that, if you have a sense, and in that context, her point was where innovation really happens, where it's churning, is at that moment where we're doing things and we don't even know what they are and how to label them. So in that sense, I'm wondering if you have a sense where 
we're going and what's next from the platform of what you have done in the past 30 years or so. Something has a label or something has a name. We didn't hear what that was from up here. Could you say again, please? So the, the statement was that as soon as you can label something, it is old news. And in a sense, you labeled biomimicry and the field incorporated bio inspiration. And really, in the last 30 years, we've been catching up with that and finding ways to scale it, put it in practice. But I'm wondering if you have a sense what's next, where is the field going? And if we look in 80 years at the vision of the city that General Motors had at the New York Fair, where we might be. So, so I think uh, Janine gave a lot of companies that have already taken this to the next level, right? So they have. They have demonstrated some success in translating the lab-based research into some practical things. And there are many more examples. I know I think I saw a poster from one of the folks here, um, and he had some very beautiful examples on his poster. So they are, they are really great practical products that are available in the market today, uh, inspired by bio, biomimicry or bioinspiration. But that, that sets the stage for, once something is, has a market value, that sets the stage and momentum for creating more things using these kinds of principles. And I think uh, Prashad sum, summarized his best that if you meet all these criteria, then there is a driving force for creating that into some kind of valuable product. So for me, the vision is there's so many opportunities in so many fields to create good solutions that outpace the currently existing solution. And they will be cheaper and better performing, and they'll be much more sustainable and adaptive to our living conditions. And I think that will continue to drive the market forces to follow this kind of ideas and this kind of solution development processes. I wish we had a, you know, everybody knows about Velcro, but they, we don't really have one of those things you can point to. There's a lot of biomimicry inside of, you know, I mean, this cell phone, the, it has, it has two microphones and a chip in between it that is actually based, Lloyd Watts is a guy who studied how our auditory system works and how we are able to listen to a conversation in a cocktail party and focus on the conversation and, and, and noise cancel everything else. And he put that software in here. And the, you know, the learning, the large learning models, AI, all of the, you know, the neural networks that allow these things to learn and get better over time are biomimetic. There's a lot that's around us that is biomimetic that we don't yet, we don't really know about, right? Um, and yet, you know, it is, it, it, they say it takes 50 years, you know, to, for, for a concept like this, a meme, to, to really get into the culture. And I think it will take, like, one of these things that's just, like, the, Vel the Velcro, but the thing that we all really needed, you know, that we go, that came from biomimicry. And what happens is, once a biomimic, always a biomimic, if somebody learns something, from the natural world, like Jeff Karp with his medical devices, he always, he and his students will always go back, right, because they, they found that it worked. They'll always go back to the natural world. So it's a, it's a matter of those kinds of examples sort of aggregating. But there's also just a cultural, there's a cultural, there could be a cultural phase change where, and that's what we, we, our mission is, is to naturalize this way of inventing so that anybody who's designing something or, or even making a decision before doing so says what in the natural world has already solved what it is I'm trying to solve and they are able to get that answer. We're not there yet and the, the way I knew it was, and, and this, is, this is like darn we're not there yet, is that that bat I showed you also was never consulted when it came to COVID, when it came to coronavirus. 
What we said was that bats might have been carriers and spill in part of the spillover of coronavirus in the wet markets in Asia. But only a few scientists around the world have said bats have been living with coronavirus for 40 million years. Let's ask them how to live with it. Because that's so obvious to me. I was like, well, that's our biomimetic hero right there. It's a bat that's full of corona and who's not having a cytokine storm, whose immune system is not going crazy, and yet it's full of coronavirus. How many people did you hear say, let's kill the bats versus let's ask the bats? There's a group called One Health, and I know you guys have had a, a KDI uh, exchange dialogue about it, where they're saying there's One Health. You know, veterinarians and wildlife ecologists, disease ecologists are, are now ho hooking up with physicians and asking those kinds of questions. But at, at the point, you know, for me, an indicator will be when all of us say the bat might have given us COVID, let's go, yay, long live the bat. We're not there yet. And that's a cultural shift. Um, if you can figure out how, that, how to make that shift happen, please let me know. After such an inspiring evening, all I can say is thank you. Thank you to Carol for organizing this amazing evening, to the Manitou Fund, to the KDI. Uh, thank you, of course, to Emily and Shashank, and of course, Janine. Thank you so very much for such an amazing evening. Thank you all. Thank you and good night.